Coming up on Doctype, we're taking things a step further with web databases and CSS3 gradients. So take a break and grab an ice cream sandwich because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by FreshBooks and Barcamp Orlando. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of coding or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. All right, so if you were into last episode where we talked about gradients and databases, you're in for a treat. Oh, yes. Because there's more. That's right. We, <laughs> we had so much stuff in the last episode that we just couldn't fit it into one episode. So this is the first time we're doing a two-parter. We're going to try it out. We hope you like it. And without further ado, let's get into it. Last week, we took a look at linear gradients. But this week, we're going to take things a step further with radial gradients. Radial gradients are good to highlight a specific area of your website with like a spotlight or a vignette effect. Let's take a look. In Firefox, set the background image of an element to Moz Radial Gradient, and in parentheses type center, circle, your inner color, the radius for your inner color, your outer color, and finally the radius for your outer color. This will create a radial gradient in the shape of a circle, but if you want to create an elliptical gradient, replace the word circle with ellipse. Each argument should be separated by a comma. WebKit is just a little bit more tricky. Basically, it works by creating two concentric circles and drawing a gradient between them. To create a radial gradient, set the background image of an element to WebKit gradient. Then, in parentheses, type radial. The next argument is the coordinates of the inner circle, followed by its radius. In this example, we'll use center center for the coordinates, but you can also use integer values. We'll set the radius to zero. Next, type the coordinates for the outer circle followed by its radius. Last, type from your first color and then to your second color. Radial gradients can be a little trickier than their linear counterparts, so I highly recommend you try this out on your own. A lot of designers, including myself, like to add a little bit of noise to their gradients. This can add some nice texture to your website and it can also help with color banding. Naturally, my first question when I was working with CSS3 gradients for the first time was, will I be able to add noise? And it turns out you can. Here's how it works. In an image editor like Photoshop, create a square image with some harsh noise. 500 pixels square should probably be enough. Then set the opacity to a very low number, like two or 3%, and save the image as a 24-bit ping. In both WebKit and Mozilla, all you have to do is use the URL function inside of your background image declaration. Set the path of the image and be sure to add a comma afterwards. This will add some nice noise to your image, but you could also use other transparent patterns on top of your gradients to give them a different texture. With the recent release of Firefox 3.6, CSS3 gradients are finally a viable option. Here's the rundown on browser compatibility. Firefox, yes. Safari, yes. Chrome, yes. Internet Explorer, sort of. To use gradients in Internet Explorer, you have two options. You could use the IE gradient filter, but trust me, you really don't want to get into the world of IE filters. A better option is to fall back to images and a special style sheet for browsers that may not necessarily support CSS3 gradients. Remember, Firefox 3.6 just came out, and there's a lot of people that still haven't upgraded. When we come back, Jim is going to be talking about web databases. FreshBooks is an easy-to-use online invoicing service that saves you time, gets you paid faster, and makes you look Fortune 500 professional. From estimates and expenses to time tracking and invoicing, FreshBooks makes everything quick and simple, letting you focus on your work. Check them out at freshbooks.com slash doctype. And if you want to learn how to build an awesome business like FreshBooks, check out their How to Build a Web App Business workshop. The San Francisco workshop at BlinkTag HQ is coming up on February 26th, but if you can't make it out to Cali, vote to bring FreshBooks to your city at freshbooks.com slash our next workshop. To get started with your free FreshBooks account, be sure to visit freshbooks.com slash doctype. Not only will you be saving yourself time and making yourself look professional, but you also will be helping keep Doctype on the air. Last week in episode 10, we looked at the Web Storage API, which provided a persistent key value database to JavaScript. This week, we'll look at the Web SQL Database API, which provides a full SQL database to the browser. 
Now I should start by saying that the Web SQL database specification is still very much a working draft. Right now only WebKit supports it, so that's pretty much Chrome, Safari, and Mobile Safari. But Mobile Safari is important. Having a browser local database provides a great way to create offline and low bandwidth applications for the iPhone, iPod Touch, and the iPad. If you're used to database programming on the server, a lot of these concepts should be familiar to you. However, the shape of your code will be a little bit different in JavaScript. In normal server database code, you go from one statement to the next and always wait for your query to be executed before going to the next line of code. In JavaScript, however, you can't do that. There's only one thread of execution, and if you're waiting for database calls, you're stopping other things from happening, like animations, drawing the UI, or pretty much anything else. Instead of writing our database queries one after the other, we call them asynchronously and use callbacks which are executed later, once the operation is completed. So your code ends up looking like a lot of nested callbacks instead of sequential statements. So let's create a simple table. First we get our database by calling open database. Each database is identified by a name and a version. The version number allows you to migrate the data should your schema change later. Then we start a transaction. Transactions allow us to roll back data if errors occur during a sequence of statements. We can call the transaction function on the database object, which takes a callback function that will be passed to the transaction object, here abbreviated TX. Then we call execute SQL on the transaction object and pass it a query string. In this example, we're creating a table with an ID, name, and shirt. In this example, we didn't have to read any data, but let's take a look at how we can read our results from other database queries. When you perform a select query, you usually want to get some data back. This is done using the result handler callback function that's passed to execute SQL. Execute SQL takes four parameters. The first is the query string, which is pretty much the SQLite dialect. The second is an array of parameters. If you use a question mark in your query string, these parameters will be placed into the query string with proper escaping. You definitely want to do this if your data comes from the user. The third argument is a result handler. This is a function that will be executed if the query runs successfully. The result handler will be passed the transaction object and the result object. The result object has a row property which contains all of the selected rows. Each row is an object with the properties that match the column names from your query. Sometimes our queries just don't work right. That's why it's important to have good error handling. The fourth and final parameter to execute SQL is an error handler. This is the function that will be called if something goes wrong in the query. It will be past the transaction object and an error object. The error object has two properties, message, which is a human readable error message, and code, which is an integer error code. The error handler also determines whether or not to roll back a transaction. If an error handler returns true, the entire transaction will be rolled back. Any changes made up to that point in the current transaction will not be committed to the database. If the error is really bad, you probably want to return true. If you return false, the transaction will continue as though no error had occurred. If it is a minor error and the rest of your query should still execute, you should return false. Now there's definitely some great information on the Safari Developer Center about real-world application of the Web SQL Database API. I definitely recommend you check it out. Now it remains to be seen if this particular specification is going to gain widespread adoption. There's not really been any news of future implementations in IE or Firefox, but if you have an application targeted at Mobile Safari, this could be a great option. If you've never been to a Barcamp event, then Barcamp Orlando is a must. It's an all-day event where the attendees are also the presenters. Before the day gets rolling, anyone can post a presentation topic to the big board with a time and place to go see it. Then, you get to pick the presentations that you want to go see. If this is your first Barcamp, we strongly encourage that you present. And you can talk about anything you want, from technology to art or even just washing your cat. Barcamp Orlando starts at 9 a.m. on April 3rd, 2010, here at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. To learn more, check out barcamporlando.com. Org. That's it for this week. Be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe by RSS or iTunes, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So until next Tuesday, remember that every great web page starts with Doctype.